Good afternoon. I am George Timmons, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Vice President of Academic Affairs at Columbia Green Community College. On behalf of our president, Dr. Carly Drummer, who unfortunately could not be here today due to a prior commitment in Boston, the, the Columbia, Columbia Green, Green Community College Board of Trustees and the entire Columbia Green Community College family, I would like to welcome our distinguished guests and other members of the audience to today's congressional field hearing on rural broadband needs in upstate New York. We are honored to host today's field hearing, which is a first for Columbia Green Community College. The field hearing is hosted by U.S. Representative Antonio Delgado, New York 19, along with Federal Communications Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. The FCC is the federal agency responsible for broadband. I would also like to recognize other public officials at today's event, including, if she's here, please stand, Assembly Member D.D. Barrett, representing Assembly District 106. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would like to recognize Patrick Hernandez and his Catskill High School students who are covering today's event for the Catskill News Project. This is an official congressional hearing. We ask that all people be respectful. If there is a disruption, officers will escort people out. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Representative Delgado for his welcoming remarks. Join me in welcoming Mr. Delgado. Good afternoon. It is good to be here. Um, I want to thank uh, the college, uh, Columbia Green, for hosting uh, this hearing. Uh, the vice president, uh, George Timmons, uh, for his kind welcome. I also want to uh, recognize the Catskill High School students who were kind enough to uh, live stream uh, and my good friend, Assemblywoman Dee Dee Barrett, uh, for being here. Uh, and of course, to everyone here uh, who has shown up to talk about a critically important issue. Uh, as I'm sure some of you know, uh, this district, the 19th, is a big one. Uh, it is nearly 8,000 square miles. Uh, it's bigger than Connecticut and Rhode Island combined. It is the eighth most rural district in the country. In the country. You can clap it up for that. I'm proud of that. And with the quality of life that we get living in this beautiful place, uh, we also are experiencing a divide. Uh, and as uh, we have a time where investment is more and more drawn on population density. Uh, rural communities aren't getting what they ought to be getting uh, and are not enabled to stay on the ever-growing information highway. And today we're here to talk about how to close that gap. Uh, and I'm honored uh, to have in our midst the Federal Communications Commissioner, Mr. Jeffrey Starks, uh, who will be able to uh, provide his own insights on what's happening in Washington and how we can get our minds wrapped around uh, to properly investing uh, in rural broadband access. It is of utmost importance, uh, not just for those who are relying uh, on access to marketplaces for their small businesses, but it's also critically important for our students who have to download their homework uh, and we hear often, too many times, there are students who have to sit in McDonald's parking lots in order to do so. And that is uncalled for. Uh, it is also important for those who seek health care through telemedicine. So this is an area of concern that affects people in a host of different ways and it is urgent. Now I'm a member, as I'm sure some of you know, of the Small Business Committee. And today's event will be in the format 
of a congressional hearing. This means that you will be hearing the witnesses testify about their experiences, and I will then ask them questions related to their testimony. This will then be entered into the congressional record, which means it can be referenced in the future for those looking to see what has transpired at this event. Uh, following the official hearing, the commissioner will ask the panel a few questions, and then I will be available for questions from the audience. I want to thank everyone again for coming today. It really means a lot to have you here, and I ask you to please join me in warmly welcoming FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. Thank you. I'm a little shorter than the congressman, so let me move this down a little bit. So thank you, of course, uh, to Congressman Delgado for uh, extending and inviting me uh, to this rural broadband field hearing today here in Hudson, New York. As many of you already know, we have had many such hearings like this here in Washington, D.C., about how to best get rural areas across this country connected to robust and affordable broadband. And while I do find those discussions in D.C. fruitful, as always, I believe it is equally important to get outside of the Beltway and to hear from people across this great country who truly understand how the lack of rural broadband and access impacts their communities and their lives. And the headline for me here today is that we need to treat rural broadband like we did rural electricity back in the 1930s. There, we executed with a clear and simple mind. We must connect all Americans. And when Americans have the will, we find the way. The lack of access to broadband in rural and low-income areas uh, is oftentimes referred to as a digital divide. I believe, however, that this persistent and widening disparity has calcified into something that is more pernicious and is something for those who it's, it's starting to harden into something about those who have and those who have not, and those who are finding themselves left behind. And the longer that communities, communities exist without adequate access to broadband, the more we see it affects the fabric of America, our economy, our democracy, and the individual dignity of those who live outside of the most connected communities. And so before we begin this hearing, I thought it was important to set a little bit of the state of play, especially with regard to the Federal Communication Commission's role in reducing internet inequality across this country. That first begins with broadband mapping. And it is no secret that our broadband maps are inadequate for those who follow this issue. And overstate broadband deployment across this country, we're hearing concerns from rural communities, civil society, industry, and Congress about the urgent need to fix our broadband maps so that we can gain a better and more accurate picture of who has broadband and where it isn't. This is necessary because billions of dollars, folks, billions of dollars are at stake. Poor data will ultimately lead to poor policy decisions which will negatively impact our underserved communities. It's up to the Federal Communications Commission to improve our data by establishing technical standards first for how data is supposed to be used. Second, we need to validate and verify this data so that we can collect and ensure that deployment is not overstated, which will cause communities that are the most in need to not get the funding that they need. And third, we need to collect more granular data that will allow us to make informed decisions about where we can actually and accurately measure progress. Our maps are critical and are, they are inhibiting us from knowing who has access to broadband. Without these maps, the FCC's Universal Service Fund we may hear about today cannot adequately serve the communities yearning to operate in 21st century society. The USF program is one of the most significant tools in the toolkit in ensuring that rural America can access the same kinds of voice and broadband services as those that live in urban, in urban areas. The FCC has taken many steps in making sure that the USF is more effective in reaching those unserved areas. So what we uh, have been doing for the last number of years is the Connect America Fund has been $1.5 billion over 10 years to support fixed broadband in nearly every state. The FCC worked with New York in particular uh, and has made over $170 million in CAF support available for allocation through the New York, New York broadband program. 
And recently, and I hope everyone pays attention here, recently the FCC has announced a $20 billion program that will be rolled out over 10 years called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. $20 billion, ladies and gentlemen. The goal of this fund is to deploy broadband in unserved census blocks, which for purposes of this new funding areas are those that lack 25 megabits per second and three megabits per second upload speeds. And so the good news is that we do have money coming, real money coming to rural communities across the nation, but we unfortunately still need to have this predicated upon accurate data. That's why I'm excited to hear thoughts today. And as you may imagine, we also need creative solutions that allow cities and municipalities, I believe, to empower themselves. And one of the best locations for that is to start, I think, at local libraries, which I believe to be the center of 21st century innovations and need to be hubs for communities across this nation. Libraries serve as a safe space for individuals and families to get connected. They are a central location with familiar faces where community members can go to build that resume, get that job training, or a job application, or have the connections that they need to better their lives. Libraries can even be a place where families go to check out a hotspot when they're unable to afford broadband connections to their home. And in order to make these goals a reality, libraries need that connected fiber that we provide through the E-Rate program and will give them the ability to innovate those hubs. Finally, one way we can get libraries connected is by encouraging rather than limiting municipal broadband. Uh, where communities who are tired of waiting for commercial broadband service to find ways to make that service available. 19 states in this country have imposed barriers, including state laws that limit or prohibit community-based broadband. One concrete step that would lead to more quality, affordable broadband being deployed in the United States would be to get legislation to prohibit these state laws that barriers, provide barriers to communities to create and implement creative solutions that lessen the internet. Further, including broadband in an infrastructure package is absolutely essential. And I thank you for your leadership, Congressman, on that front as part of the Rural Broadband Task Force. Finally, the witnesses here today represent a wide variety of perspectives. As small as business owners, superintendents, school districts, healthcare representatives, electric cooperatives, and community activists, their stories are unique and personal on the one hand, but they represent uh, the issue faced by a larger set of rural Americans at the very same time. And so I look forward to learning from the leaders of this community and how best to address internet inequality. Thank you again uh, to both this community and to Congressman Delgado for having me here today. Good morning. The committee will come to order. I want to again thank all of you for joining us this morning and a special thanks to Jeffrey Starks, the SEC Commissioner, and the witnesses uh, for being here today. I want to open uh, with an observation. As you will notice, there is no service in this auditorium. <laughs> this is unfortunately the rule, and not the exception here uh, in the Twin Counties, and all across upstate and New York's 19th congressional district. Small businesses Families, schools, and health care providers in upstate suffer daily from a lack of consistent access to high-speed broadband services. This is due in large part to lack of investment in broadband infrastructure. Broadband services should not be treated as a luxury, but as a basic utility and essential for all communities. Rural communities like this one have been left behind because high costs and low subscription promises little profits. But small businesses and families in rural communities deserve equal access to affordable broadband services at comparable speeds. We all realize it is more difficult and expensive to build out broadband networks in these areas, but that's no excuse. We must take swift and deliberate action to close the digital divide between our urban and rural economies. Over 26% of Americans in rural America lack access to high-speed broadband compared to 1.7 percent 
in urban areas. Unequal access to high-speed broadband reduces economic opportunity for millions of Americans and small businesses. Small businesses in rural America are already struggling to compete with their urban counterparts and falling further behind as technology rapidly advances. Now, I hear from business owners through my Small Business Advisory Committee and time here at home that there are small businesses which serve as the backbone of our economy that can't complete simple payment transactions because their internet service goes down over 100 times a day. Others say that they are paying for enterprise-level high-speed service to get 100 megabits per second speeds, but are only getting one or two megabits per second speeds. Standard broadband service has devastating impacts on small business. In fact, small firms that are digitally connected each earn twice as much revenue per employee, experience four times the revenue growth year over year, and are three times more likely to create jobs. These limitations harm rural small business and the communities that they serve. A startling 58% of rural Americans believe that lack of access to high-speed internet is a problem in their hometowns. Congress must work to coordinate federal resources and make common sense investments in targeted infrastructure projects. That is why I join Majority Whip Jim Clyburn on the House Rural Broadband Task Force to ensure that investments in rural broadband are included in any comprehensive infrastructure package that passes through the House. For many years, the FCC and USDA's Rural Utility Service have made strides to foster the development of broadband networks in rural communities through grants and loans, but this is just one of many steps we can take to address the lack of access to rural broadband, and much more must be done. If you've heard me talk about broadband before, you will know I am deeply committed to addressing the flawed mapping process that undercounts our rural communities. The federal government must have accurate data to ensure that funds and resources are being efficiently allocated to expand coverage to underserved areas. However, reports and widespread public outcry confirm that the FCC's maps are grossly overstated and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration's outdated map was decommissioned. There is strong evidence that the percentage of Americans without broadband access is much higher than the FCC's numbers indicate. So we took action. On the Small Business Committee, we held hearings on broadband mapping and rural broadband access, calling for the FCC to improve its Form 477 data collection and require carriers to submit more granular data. Last month, the FCC issued an order requiring a new data collection that will capture more accurate data and potentially phase out Form 477 altogether. The FCC also voted to open a rulemaking proceeding to establish a new fund, as the commissioner noted, offering $20.4 billion in funding over a 10-year period using data from the improved data collection. I will be keeping a watchful eye on the FCC's progress on its improved data collection and implementation of its new fund. As a member of the House Committee on Agriculture and Democratic Rural Broadband Task Force, I will continue to push legislation that delivers federal funding for broadband infrastructure investments both at the FCC and the USDA. I've also heard from small businesses, farmers, and students about the impact of slow download speeds and unreliable connections. Without access to reliable internet, small firms in rural areas miss opportunities to connect with new customers and can't take advantage of cost-saving tools like digital payment processing and online distribution services. Schools and healthcare providers are also impact, impacted by a lack of access. Today, more than 70% of teachers assign homework that requires access to broadband. The students that don't have access suffer from the cruelest part of the digital divide. Small rural healthcare facilities also need access to telehealth services to reach specialists at larger urban hospitals, offer connected care to monitor chronic health problems and save lives. Without reliable access to high-speed internet services, the opportunities are missed and loved ones are lost. The small internet service providers that do operate and serve these communities need additional resources to get broadband infrastructure projects off the ground. 
Operators like rural electrical co-ops have made use of their valuable infrastructure to serve rural households and businesses, and small ISPs have made significant investments in fiber networks but need access to federal funding to expand their efforts. The FCC's matching partnership with the New York State Broadband Program Office has invested millions of dollars in funding and connected thousands of homes and small businesses, but we need to see more federal and state government partnerships in order to close the divide in rural areas around the country and ensure that all communities have access to reliable service. It is painfully clear that private investment is not enough. We need connectivity now. High-speed broadband is not a luxury. It is essential to the economic development of the communities and the survival of small businesses. However, these connections can only be realized with swift and deliberate action, federal investment, and accurate maps. I hope that today's discussion will shed light on ways to improve connectivity in rural communities. I look forward to working with my colleagues in Congress to increase federal investment in broadband infrastructure and bridge the digital, digital divide. I thank each of the witnesses for joining us today, and I look forward to your testimony. Now, I would like to just take a minute to explain the timing rules. Each witness will get five minutes to testify, and members, in this case, member, will get five minutes uh, for questioning. Now, there's a lighting system to assist you. Now, the green light, which typically would be the case if we were in Washington, we are not in Washington, so there are no green lights, but... <laughs> But typically, there'd be a green light, and with about a minute left, you see a yellow light. I'm going to be the yellow light as well. And then there will be a red light, and I'll be the red light. And when the red light pokes up, uh, you will then have to stop, and I will politely ask you uh, to conclude your testimony. Uh, that way, we can keep the conversation going. Uh, and now, I would like to introduce uh, the witnesses for today's panel. Our first witness is Tim Johnson, who hails from Edmonston, New York. Mr. Johnson is the CEO of Otsego Electric Cooperative. Uh, Mr. Johnson has been the Chief Executive Officer and General Counsel of Otsego Electric Cooperative and the OE Connect Fiber subsidiary since May 2016. Prior to that, Tim was a lawyer in private practice for 27 years, from 1985 to 2012, with offices in Edmiston, Morris, and Cooperstown. During this time, Tim represented Otsego Electric Cooperative, two other rural electric cooperatives here in New York, and numerous other nonprofits, charities, and municipalities. He left private practice in 2012 to become Assistant General Counsel at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association in Arlington, Virginia. Tim studied at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, where he received bachelor's and master's degrees. He obtained a law degree in Albany Law School, at Albany Law School, of Union University. Tim is married, has three children, and resides in Edmonton. Welcome, Mr. Johnson. Our second witness, Mrs. Miss Shannon Hayes. Uh, Miss Hayes is the owner of Sap Bush Hollow Farm Store and Cafe in West Fulton, New York. Uh, Miss Hayes grew up in the Sap Bush Hollow Farm uh, in the heart of Schoharie County, which she now operates with her husband, parents, and her two daughters. Uh, in 2016, she added a community cafe to the farm's offerings and could be found in their cooking breakfast on Saturday mornings. When she isn't flipping eggs, she is homeschooling her two daughters, writing books, or just hanging out in the wilderness. Shannon holds a PhD in sustainable agriculture and community development from Cornell University. Her work has been featured in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Brainchild Magazine, U.S. News and World Report, Farm Quarterly, Elle Magazine, and many other publications. Ms. Hayes' weekly essays about her attempts to live a balanced and sustainable life can be found on her blog, theradicalhomemaker.net. Welcome, Ms. Hayes. Our third witness is Mr. David Berman. Mr. Berman is co-chair of Columbia Connect in Ghent, New York, a resident of Ghent. Mr. Berman is a technology media consultant with a long career in those complementary fields. His career began in the world of closed-circuit television where he produced the broadcast of several Muhammad Ali's biggest fights. I'm a fan. Uh, this led to a five-year stint at CBS Sports where he was managing director of the European operation based in London. He returned to New York as vice president of CBS Broadcast International in charge of production, operations, administration for 11 years. 
that followed by seven years at the first global private satellite company, Pan AmSat. Currently, he is a consultant to several Silicon Valley companies while serving as the co-chair of Connect Columbia, chair of the Ghent Broadband Committee on the Columbia County Broadband Committee. Every facet of his career from the beginning to present day has required more and more bandwidth. Welcome, Mr. Berman. Our fourth witness is Mr. Jason Miller. Uh, Mr. Miller is general manager of Delhi Telephone Company in Delhi, New York. Jason Miller is the vice president, treasurer, and general manager of Delhi Telephone Company and DTC Cable. Jason started with DTC in May of 2008 and has held various roles within the company over the past 11 years, becoming general manager in 2013. DTC currently maintains the following business lines, local telephone, long distance, internet, television, security, and IT consulting. DTC has over 35 employees and over 3,500 customers. DTC has partnered with Margaretville Telephone Company and Delaware County Electric Cooperative on the Delaware County Board Initiative, I'm sorry, initiative since 2015. Jason currently is chairman of the NYSTA, uh, NYSTA uh, Government Affairs Committee, is a member of the NCCA Government Affairs Committee, is on the board of directors for the New York uh, STA and the NTCA Rural Broadband PAC, PAC. Jason has a bachelor's degree in accounting from Syracuse University and a master's of business administration degree from Binghamton University. Jason currently resides in Delaware County in the town of Masonville with his wife, Julie, and four children, Lily, John, Ben, and AJ. Welcome, Mr. Miller. We're getting there. Our fifth witness. Mr. Brian Dunn. Uh, Mr. Dunn is the superintendent of Middleburg Central School District in Middleburg, New York. Uh, in his 20 years of work in the field, he has been an English teacher at Albany High School, assistant principal at Troy High School, and principal of Troy Middle School. He attended Christian Brothers Academy in Albany, New York, and attended college at the College of St. Rose in SUNY Albany. He is a passion, passionate mountain trail runner, fly fisher, and reader of history. He's a strong supporter of rural schools, the First Amendment, and world peace. He lives in West Charlton, New York, with his wife, three children, and cat named Twinkles. Welcome, Mr. Dunn. <laughs> and our final witness, Mr. Dr. Cliff Belden. Dr. Belden is the chief medical officer of Columbia Memorial Health here in Hudson, New York. Uh, Dr. Belden is a neuroradiologist by training, and prior to coming to Columbia Moral Hospital, held leadership positions in both rural and urban environments, having served as the chair of radiology at Temple University in Philadelphia, and the chair of radiology and chief clinical officer at Dartmouth in rural New Hampshire. Dr. Belden attended RPI for his undergraduate work in Albany Medical College, where he graduated as a valedictorian. His radiology training was at the University of Florida and John Hopkins University. Dr. Belden served as a physician in the U.S. Army at Brook Army Medical Center, San Antonio, Texas, from 1998 to 2002, where he achieved the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He also received a Master's in Healthcare Delivery Science from Dartmouth. Outside of his medical work, Dr. Belden and his wife, Marianne, have a 100-acre farm in Hoosick, New York, which they actively farm, selling to local restaurants and at farmer's markets. Welcome, Dr. Belden. I will now recognize each witness for five minutes to provide their testimony. Mr. Johnson, you are recognized for five minutes. Can everybody hear me? Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify about broadband and its importance to rural areas. I'm Tim Johnson. As I'm sorry. <laughs> Talk closer, closer. Speak into the mic and I can't move my head then. All right, I'm Tim Johnson, CEO at Otsego Electric Cooperative, as I was introduced. Uh, we're located near Cooperstown. Uh, our cooperative serves approximately 4,500 electric meter locations in the Otsego County area primarily. Uh, these are consumers that investor-owned owner utilities bypassed, partially due to our sparse population. In early 2017, Otsego Electric was awarded New York broadband grants of $14 million, including $4 million in CAF funds. We announced plans to begin offering high-speed, affordable broadband to help our consumer members fully participate in the 21st century economy. Ultimately, 
OEC will make service available to all of our consumer members with fiber speeds of it uh, up to one gigabit. At, at this time, we actually already do that. Uh, the electric cooperative industry serves over 40 million Americans and covers 56% of the U.S. land mass. More than 100 electric cooperatives across the country are currently working toward meaningful solutions to bridge this digital divide. We believe electric co-ops are ideally suited for this task. However, we have several policy concerns that we believe you all can help with. Uh, first is the federal tax code. Uh, cooperatives desperately need your help fixing a 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act mistake that happened uh, in 2017, but we need it fixed by the end of this year. Uh, OEC unexpectedly stands to lose as much as $3 million of our broadband grants to taxation. This makes absolutely no sense. We bid under 2018 pre-tax law rules, so the train had already left the station, so to speak, when the new tax bill arrived. Most rural electric cooperatives are tax exempt under 501c12, and no more than 15% of our income can come from non-member sources in order to remain tax exempt. The Tax Act mistakenly made all public grants uh, potentially taxable to cooperatives. This includes FEMA grants. Uh, terrible mistake. If a federal legislative fix is not passed by the end of this year, we will also lose our tax exempt status. Fortunately, a bipartisan legislative solution has been introduced in the House and Senate uh, co-sponsored by our host, uh, Congressman Delgado, uh, this past April. The legislation will allow co-ops to accept grants without jeopardizing their tax status, but the bill has not been scheduled for a vote yet. Uh, we need your help and support on this bill. Mapping. Um, I'd like to mention mapping. I, I suppose some of our other panelists will mention this, and it's already been mentioned, but a critical step for us in deploying rural broad broadband is to improve our maps. We need to do away with a one-served, all-served census block concept. We need to gather more granular, standardized data on coverage and performance levels, and we should incorporate crowdsourcing as a way to fund projects. We need a better challenge process to flag issues with data and maps. We are encouraged the FCC and Congress are already working on these issues. Public funding. As a nonprofit cooperative, we operate at cost, and our access to capital is limited by what our member consumers are willing to contribute through the rates they pay. The current federal programs at the USDA and at the FCC, geared toward reducing the upfront capital investments, are necessary to achieve widespread expansion of high-speed broadband. The upcoming uh, RDOF, or Rural Digital Opportunities Fund, will distribute $20 billion via reverse auction to help build service of at least 25 up and three down <coughs> megabits per second uh, to large swaths of rural America. We believe uh, added auction points should be given to gigabit expandable fiber to the home service projects where feasible. This is the gold standard we should all strive for everywhere. One minute. Thank you. One quick comment on New York's broadband program. It's been a great program so far. However, it left many gaps due to mapping and funding problems. Over 70,000 locations in New York were relegated to satellite service, as many of us know. We need funding for gigabit fiber to the home services, to be fair to all. The bottom line is we need public money. There isn't enough rate of return for private investors to get involved in many of these projects. In conclusion, Otsego Electric and electric cooperatives all over the country are ready and willing to take on this challenge. We did it 75 years ago with electric service, and we can do this project as well. We look forward to working with you and everyone and expanding all the benefits broadband has to offer. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Ms. Hayes, you are not recognized for five minutes. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Quick storytelling now. My name is Shannon and I live um, up in the hills of Schoharie County up against a 2,000 acre state forest five miles from my family farm. 
And I'm a child of the farm crisis. It forced youth out of my community like insects in the spray line of pesticides. It was whispered in the halls of my school that only the losers stayed around after graduation. Everybody else fled. So dutifully, I went away to college, but I came home every other weekend because I loved being a part of my family's farms, and I hated to be away from those dirt roads and the farm-grown food and the woodlands and the neighbors and the stone walls that define my world. I eventually got a PhD, as you heard about, and my husband and I were qualified to take on careers at any of the land-grant colleges around the country, but we weren't qualified to come back to our own beautiful yet economically depressed Schoharie County. We didn't go job hunting. We bought a cabin up in Middleburg Telephone Company's service area, as opposed to my parents' farm a few miles down the road, which was in Verizon's area. Um, and after graduation, I told my parents that I had come to only one certain conclusion, and that was that our family, our community, and our farm could not afford this continued loss of the brains, the brains, the creativity, and the energy of the next generation. And the idea of commuting to a job someplace just filled us with abject misery. So we stayed put, and we lived cheap, and we worked with my parents to grow Sapbush Hollow. And in a few years, uh, Bob and I actually had an opportunity to cash in on our cabin in the woods and buy a farm next to mom and dad. But if we moved, we would be giving up our local provider and moving into a Verizon district. And at this point, I was the primary communications person for our business. Moving our home offices would put us on the service fringe of an urban phone company, and it was an area that had long suffered from telecommunications neglect. But a few miles down the road, we had the benefit of being covered by a rural telecommunications company that specialized in people like us. So at that moment, we had to make a choice about the future of our farm, increase production or guarantee our telecommunications. Without good telecommunications, we would lose marketing opportunities and the ability to be in contact with our customers to handle our financials efficiently without constant trips to town. Without the telecommunications, we would lose the ability to order supplies online and we'd have to take a day's work just away from the farm just to drive into Albany. We would lose out on access to online veterinary diagnostic resources, the ability with other, to network with other farmers about changes in the industry, and the ability to participate in online professional development opportunities like seminars for improving grazing practices or learning more humane and ecologically responsible growing practices. So we stayed put. Instead of buying a farmland, we made a radically different choice. We bought our community's post office building and former firehouse and moved our farm center of commerce off the farm and into our rural hamlet. Part of this decision was to give the community an economic jump start. Part of it thought that, hey, why not in the middle of upstate New York? Who wouldn't love an espresso bar and farm to table cafe? <laughs> Y'all come, please. Okay. And the final reason, the internet there was decent. Our industry is changing fast with online developments, and if we don't keep up, we're going to lose our farm for all of the reasons that I just mentioned. Throughout this time now, we started a family and chose to homeschool our daughters. Our oldest, she practically taught herself to read, but the youngest would pick up books and hold them upside down, and she would, um, she would bounce into things, bump into things. She confused people's names and faces. And we eventually learned she's legally blind in one eye and she had reduced vision in the other and she has a condition called cerebral visual impairment. Through smart, she's smart, she's motivated, but she was severely academically learning disabled. Our rural school, which you'll hear from today, did its best to help us, but it did not have all the resources we needed and we faced walking away from this whole family business just to get our daughter the education because the only schools that could help us were in Canada or Boston and they were going to cost us about $40,000 a year, far more than our annual income here in Upstate. But what if we could get our learning environment equipped to accommodate her? If we could outfit our house with fast internet, I could make huge academic inroads with my kids. Is that for me? Oh, no. Okay. If we could my time you out there, I don't know. <laughs> you do have about a minute. Okay. If we could equip our proposed community cafe with good internet, then we could become a hub for all those other neighbors in the Verizon area. So we asked Midtel for help, and within a year's time, we came up with a solution, and we had better, faster internet than what you'll find in downtown uh, Albany. 
My oldest daughter enrolled in online classes. My youngest got enhanced visual access to any book or audiobook in the world, and she became an avid fan of science podcasts. And she's gone from being a child that they did not think would read or write to this funny, articulate, and artistic preteen. I encourage you to say hello to both of them today. And the cafe, hey, it's open Saturdays only. It's pretty good. Um, Folks come for food and to socialize and to check their emails and download media. And since we worked our arrangement, our family farm has experienced 100% growth, evidence of what you were talking about, Mr. Delgado, um, through our cafe, our farm store sales, our farm market, and our online sales. A small eco resort has now opened up in our hamlet, and the community has gained a farmstead cider tasting room, two local arts groups, and a yoga studio and a yoga studio, each of them certain that they could move forward with rural businesses because they could be guaranteed high quality internet. There's talk that West Fulton, New York is pulling itself up by the bootstraps. We started an Airbnb above the cafe and we now bring tourists from all over the world here to West Fulton where people want to experience our farm fresh food right, and our waterfalls. Okay. Up on the end now. All right. Up on the end. So the long story is talk to my kids Afterwards, if you want to find out what their future holds, they're not thinking about running away like I had to. They're thinking about staying here in upstate New York. We are, because there's opportunities now, we're losing the rural brain drain, and I'm appreciative of what broadband has done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Mr. Berman, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Congressman Delgado, for this opportunity. I'm the co-chair of Connect Columbia, the Citizens Action Committee made up of elected officials and interested residents that have branded together to bring true broadband to the people of Columbia County. My co-chair, Patty Matheny, is also here. Let me define true broadband in 2019 terms. A minimum of a symmetrical 100 megabits per second growing to a symmetrical 1 gigabit per second within five years. The FCC's commission's definition is considerably out of date and needs to be upgraded immediately. Many of our international competitors are already at the gigabit level. With that out of the way, let me just take a moment to describe the current conditions in Columbia County. We were fortunate to receive over $30 million from Governor Cuomo's broadband initiative with the help of our Assemblywoman Dee Dee Barrett and Connect America funding. This has taken us to coverage for most of our residents but still leaves huge gaps in our geography. Why? Because the economics require density of potential subscribers, which effectively penalizes rural areas. The state and CAF money were used to fiber those areas where density made the economics work, and then a very confusing satellite overlay was applied to theoretically give everyone access, which it decidedly did not. As I'm sure the commissioner is aware, the use of high latency, moderate to low throughput satellite technology is merely a band-aid that cannot meet current demand, much less the exponentially growing demand. So how do we fill in the holes to give everyone access to true high-speed broadband that has scalable technology to meet growing speed and capacity requirements? Even though current federal programs are constructed to fix the basic problem of access, their requirements effectively preclude those they are designed to help. An example is a recent program that required an area to have 90% of the population to lack coverage. That lacks coverage. Sounds logical, doesn't it? So consider a farming area with a central village. The village population overwhelmingly exceeds the farming one and therefore 90% can't be achieved. The measurement is correct economically from a cost per person serve basis, but fails miserably to provide access to rural areas where modern agriculture requires cutting edge technology to effectively manage the process of growing our food supply, not to mention the children of farmers who need access to all the educational tools and resources that are now required. The only solution to this issue is to base local, state, and federal programs on the goal of reaching every address in the United States. That means scrapping the use of census blocks to define coverage, availability, financing, etc. Very simply, census blocks are both confusing and lead to some bizarre results. A perfect example is the street behind my house in Ghent, German Church Road. Like many streets, it bisects two census blocks. So under the <coughs> state program, one, one of those blocks was granted money for broadband and the other wasn't. So a provider doesn't get reimbursed for providing service to the other side of the street. Clearly, every address that gets electricity should get broadband. Just like electricity, which runs many devices essential to our lives, 
large capacity communication capability is far more than voice, internet, email, and tweets. We are still in the early stages of what big pipe connectivity can do beyond those mentioned, with efficiencies in healthcare at the top of the list. It is no longer practical to separate internet vo access from voice and television since they all come over the same wire, fiber, or frequency. Two out of three can't be ubiquitous while one remains unavailable. It is, <coughs> excuse me, it is more important than ever in this economy to ensure every business and every person is connected to the content they want, just as they can speak to anyone via traditional, what's known as POTS in the telephone world. It's called plain old telephone service. <laughs> the Commission, as a regulatory body, needs to expand its vision to encourage expansion of existing technologies and leave the door wide open for new ones that will enable even more ways to connect and ensure security. Finally, Congress must act to rationalize the myriad number of competing programs that are ostensibly are in place to facilitate the expansion of broadband and then expedite the actual work being done, completed, and importantly measured so that suppliers meet the needs of consumers. And I apologize to my wife and children for not including them in my biography. <laughs> <laughs> but you were in within five minutes. How about that? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Right now, I would like to recognize Mr. Miller for five minutes. Am I close enough to the mic? No. 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 All right. Congressman Delgado, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the importance of rural broadband and closing the digital divide. My name is Jason Miller. I am currently the Vice President, Treasurer, and General Manager of Delhi Telephone Company, DTC, which was founded in 1897. We also have DTC Cable, uh, and they're both headquartered in Delhi, New York. I started with DTC in May of 2008 and have held various roles, and over the last over the last 11 years, becoming GM in 2013. DTC currently provides our customers with local telephone, long distance, internet, television, security, and IT consulting. DTC has over 35 employees and 3,500 customers. We recently, in 2015, we partnered with Marketable Telephone Company and the Delaware County Electric Cooperative for the Delaware County Broadband Initiative, we call it DCBI. As part of this partnership, DTC has received $30 million uh, in projects. That's our portion, just DTC's portion, in New York State Grant Awards. DTC will be completing 1,200 miles of fiber optic builds, passing approximately 15,000 homes mostly outside of our regulated telephone franchise territory. With this build, DTC will be in 17 communities. Deploying broadband takes time and includes many hurdles. Through our company's long experience in the industry, combined with much needed support from the federal and state governments, we've been able to successfully deploy these networks in and around Delhi, New York, for the rural residents of our community. Rural areas present unique issues to DTC and the more than 850 rural broadband providers represented by NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association, that serve nearly 35% of the nation's land mass, but less than 5% of the population. Low population densities and significant distances are the root cause of why it's very difficult to build a business case to provide broadband in these high cost areas left behind by large providers and to then sustain these networks and services once deployed. In order to succeed in delivering reliable internet service, it takes support at the federal, state, and or local levels, along with the aforementioned commitment to the community. It is the public-private partnership model that has resulted in getting broadband to our customers and should serve as a model for reaching and then sustaining the delivery of broadband in the remaining unserved rural areas. Rural broadband has far-reaching effects, creating efficiencies in healthcare, education, agriculture, energy, and commerce. A report released in 2019 by Purdue University in conjunction with the Foundation for Rural Service, FRS, found that in 2017, small rural communications providers in the United States contributed to more than 77,000 jobs and supported more than 10 billion in economic activities across a wide range of industries. Additionally, a Cornell University study found that rural counties with the highest levels of broadband adoption have the highest levels of income and education and lower levels of unemployment and poverty. Despite this great progress, many parts of rural America will still need better connectivity, and even where broadband has been deployed, sustaining it in areas where consumers are scattered across great distances is itself a substantial and often underappreciated challenge. As policymakers consider potential initiatives for broadband infrastructure deployment, including USDA's Broadband Reconnect Program and the FCC's upcoming Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, I believe it is essential to build upon what has worked to date. In doing so, there are several key principles that should guide next steps on infrastructure policy. 
These principles include providing federal support to make the business case for invest investment and ongoing operation, leveraging existing experience and expertise, making long-term capital investments, targeting resources for new construction, coordination of efforts among many governmental programs, streamlining construction processes, and ensuring accountability for any recipients of scarce federal resources. Accurate broadband mapping data is also critical to the ability to deliver and sustain service in rural America, and bad mapping data risks leaving rural consumers stranded without broadband. Even as there is a push to improve the standards and the granularity of how providers report, it is equally important not to forget the importance of making sure that there is some opportunity to double check the accuracy of the data being self-reported by providers. Well, the, Thanks. the FCC has taken significant strides recently to move for toward more granular and accurate broadband availability, data collections and maps, but Congress has an important role here and can and should provide vital guidance and direction to the FCC on how to provide, proceed next. Due in large part to the commitment of leaders like Congressman Delgado and others on this committee, small rural broadband providers like DTC and others and NTCA's membership have made great strides in reducing the digital divide in rural America, but the job is far from done. Robust broadband must be available, affordable, and sustainable for rural small businesses and underserved populations to realize the benefits that advanced connectivity offers. On behalf of DTC and NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association, your commitment to identifying and solving these challenges is greatly appreciated. Thank you for inviting me to be with you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Mr. Dunn, you're not recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Congressman. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be part of this uh, committee and to have an opportunity to uh, express my own meager experience um, and voice to this very complicated problem. <coughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a superintendent of Middleburg. And you can't talk about Middleburg unless you go back to 2011, uh, Hurricane Irene, which devastated our community. Literally, the school was flooded up to four feet uh, into the basement. And so where we work and where we learn is um, undergoing another um, renewal. And when you talk about rural renewal, you have to talk about high quality schooling. If you don't have high quality schooling with innovative technology, with great teachers who care and are invested and who, for, who stay for the long haul, you're not going to experience a high quality renewal that lasts and sustains itself over time. My new friend, Miss Hayes, to my right, you could hear the spirit in her voice, the hope in her voice, when constituents are connected to information across the globe. It empowers our citizens, it empowers our youth, and it empowers our schools to join together to meet several wolves at the door. As a superintendent, the number one wolf at my door is safety and security. The second wolf at my door is never mentioned in any meeting, and that's the digital divide. So I thank you for bringing it up but also deeper in the question of digital division is artificial intelligence and its impact on local economies and on schooling and how we teach and learn. The working class jobs continue to morph and change and go away. What is going to happen when driverless trucks and cars and trains take over the market in the next 10, 15 years? That is a reality that is coming. And so the best way to inoculate our students and our families and to impart them with the skills they need, we have to have excellent broadband, not only in the schools, but most importantly in all homes. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, there's a strong voice of optimism coming from Middleburg and Schoharie County. Not only do we have fired up residents like Ms. Hayes, organizing, communicating, planning, working together, but we have a very strong infrastructure project that's 90% underway, led by our partner, Midtel, where 90% of our families are connected with fiber. Now that will make all the difference for us in Middleburg because in, hopefully this year, we're going to get a $1 million smart schools grant after waiting for three years. It is coming and I'm grateful for it, but we're gonna have to make great use of that in the school but like was mentioned earlier, homework is going to be on a laptop computer that we are gonna send home. And 
all the families have to be connected with something they can afford that's high quality. Because our kids, as you all know, are competing globally. I always remember Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. It is truly getting flatter. So with that, I just want to remind everyone it's a complicated issue. We in Squaharie County and Middleburg in particular, we are grateful, we're moving forward, but we always remember that good is the enemy of great. And if you expect American, New York, Squaharie kids to compete on a global stage, our technology cannot be a one-shot deal. We have to continue to get quality funding, quality support from local, state, and federal levels, and we will work with you. So with that, I, I hope my testimony meant something. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunn. Um, Dr. Belden, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide some comments today on this important topic. My testimony today is going to be focused on the impact that broadband internet access and the lack thereof has on health care and the delivery of health care in rural areas. So there are three broad areas where broadband impacts the delivery of health care. The patient, the location of services that you uh, are able to get at any facility or, or the types of services in that facility, as well as it has an important impact on our workforce. So first, the patient. The patient is the center of why organizations like Columbia Memorial Health exists in rural counties. 25% of the population of the United States lives in rural counties, but only 10% of the physicians are in those same rural areas, creating a significant mismatch between the need and the availability of physicians and other healthcare providers. This mismatch is even greater in subspecialties particularly in those where there's a nationwide shortage, such as obstetrics, dermatology, child psychiatry. Mm -hmm. Telemedicine has been championed as a tool to improve care and help bring the input and expertise of specialties and specialists to rural communities and their patients. Telemedicine has many different forms, and I'll touch on two of them today, remote patient visits and remote telemonitoring of Face-to-face -face teleconferencing between patients and a provider at their home or a medical facility allows a patient who's referred to a specialist or perhaps needs follow-up from one of their physicians to see that patient, that provider, without traveling for an appointment. Generally, it's done over security, a secure video conferencing platform. This results in improved access to specialists, and the patients get that benefit of not having to travel, particularly as we all know what the winters can be like around here. At Columbia Memorial Health, we've been using a, uh, doing a pilot with a local nursing home and our cardiology and pulmonary physicians, where they can evaluate patients without needing to transport the patient to the hospital after they've been discharged. We know there's over 50% more use of telemedicine visits when a rural county has a high penetrance of broadband, and it's such an important tool. Remote patient monitoring is a second tool that involves providing patients with certain medical conditions, devices such as scales, uh, blood oxygen level monitors, heart rate monitors, uh, in order to get that data back to their providers to ward off any change in their condition. Remote monitoring with these medical conditions can have a dramatic impact for the patients. For patients with congestive heart failure, remote telemonitoring decreases hospital admissions and readmissions up to 50% and also has an impact on mortality and quality of life. Similarly, treatment costs are lower and readmissions are lower for patients with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease when we use remote patient monitoring. At Columbia Memorial Health, we've begun to use these remote telemonitoring devices for some of our patients. However, there are some challenges. Without broadband access, the monitoring equipment requires a dedicated cell phone and cellular service plan to be provided along with that. To offer this service, 
we provide that cell phone, we provide the data plan, and the expense exceeds uh, what the government now reimburses for the services, as well as limits our ability when we apply for grants to start these programs. It's also impossible to deploy in areas that don't have a cell signal. One minute. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is how the location of medical facilities is impacted by broadband. We have a lot of different types of medical facilities, all of which require highly reliable connected internet service. We have one, two outside clinics that still uh, use microwave transmission for their broadband access, and one that has a lower speed, non-commercial grade uh, access. That limits what they can see and how quickly they access patient records. Finally, I'd just like to say, for the health care, the health provider, where you live matters. And if you're a radiologist, orthopedic surgeon, many of the specialists, or even primary care provider, you need uh, high-grade internet access in order to perform your job. Increasingly, we're required to make decisions quickly at home with the data we can obtain via the internet. So, in summary, our request is simple. People who choose to live in a rural community should have the same access to tools that improve their health as those who live elsewhere. And I appreciate the efforts that you're making on that behalf. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate uh, the testimony from everyone. Uh, really informative uh, and really appreciate the time that you put into the testimony. I'll now recognize uh, myself uh, to ask uh, some questions. Uh, first, I want to uh, begin with Ms. Hayes. Uh, your testimony was very illuminating. Um, and uh, as you know, we have a lot of farmers uh, in our district. Um, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we are a very rural district. Uh, I think something like 5,000 Farmers, about 8,000 farm operations uh, or operators. Uh, and there's no doubt that farmers want to be able to earn a livable income from their business. Uh, and you've had to seek alternative business opportunities to keep your farm operating. Could you please share, and I know you got a little bit into this in your testimony, how access to affordable high speed broadband can help farmers and other small business owners expand uh, their business? What were the ways for you that it allowed the expansion of uh, business? Okay. Um, first, I do want to underscore that in, in the case of my farm, we could go out to coffee and talk about the farm bill and the nation's cheap food policy and commodity production, but I'll, I'll leave you off the hook. do that. Yeah, okay. So anyhow, um, I want to underscore, though, that diversification in the case of my farm is a choice. Diversification is ecologically beneficial and enables us to serve local markets and the community more effectively. And it has helped us here to become an anchor business and an economic driver in our community. Um, so one of the ways that it, it has helped us in, you know, you've already heard about the way the business is diversified with providing local food and providing um, online services um, and in terms of online shopping and things like that. Um, we have to teach constantly. Basically, uh, in our nation's agricultural history and food history, every generation since World War II has forgotten how to cook. Um, uh, our, it, it's very true. Um, uh, your people today, your constituents, are time-strapped. They're economically strapped. And processed foods, every generation gets a new processed food, but processed foods are what they turn to, and the next, and they're not teaching the next generation. I'm a farmer, and I need people to buy real food. I have to constantly educate. And this is where the broadband is extremely important to me. The next thing is it does create this multiplier effect, as I, as I mentioned. People are coming into the area to see Sapush Hollow. They're staying, for example, in our vacation lodging. And then they're putting that money in all the different businesses in the area because they want to see what we're talking about on the internet. They want to see the beautiful waterfalls that we show. They want to taste the food that we're telling them how to cook. So we constantly have to educate to keep our heads above the water. And we're bringing people in and getting them to experience the rest of the businesses. Thank you, and I think the, the multiplier effect piece is, is critically important. And uh, 
not just teach folks, you know, where good food is, but also to connect the folks who are providing it, right? And to the extent that we can have connectivity uh, and set up localized distribution uh, centers, food hubs, farm hubs, uh, we can't do that in the absence of broadband access. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Dunn, um, yes, Mr. Dunn, as a superintendent of Middleburg uh, Central School District, can you discuss, and I know you've talked a bit about this, but more detail, uh, how improved broadband uh, has impacted uh, students uh, in your classrooms? Well, in the context of the flood, our school system took a dive. And I've only been there a short while, under two years, but I took over an organization with an 18% graduation rate. Um, and that, that's 18% of your kids not getting a diploma. And that's, that's, that's very significant. And you also have to look at advanced readings diploma acquisition as college ready. So a lot of our economic indicators were down. Um, but what, so that, that's a whole complicated turnaround discussion, but how technology influences turnaround uh, locally and in schools is it provides resources for people to research, to dialogue and access best practices to improve their pedagogy. And so what you, what you, you have is a more highly trained teaching force, you have more highly trained and motivated administrators, and you have opportunities and resources curricular-wise for kids to engage in project-based learning, to improve their reading, to improve their networking. Uh, don't forget distance learning. We have a lot of distance learning, and one of the things we're working on right now, I'm really proud of, you know, how do you engage in diversity and inclusive, inclusivity discussions in a school system that's 99% white? We have distance learning. Well, who are we distance learning with? We did a research project on it, and it's mostly other white constituencies and schools. So we're now we're investigating with a couple of partners. Well, how can we get access to urban distance learning to mix it up a bit? Because that's the world. That's a state university system. Those are the big cities, and that's a big part of the Every Student Succeeds Act is you know, creating equity and inclusion for all. So um, technology and high quality technology is a great lever and a tool for progress and change. Excellent, thank you, thank you for that. And um, Dr. Belden, uh, you, you kind of alluded to this, but I want you to unpack it a bit more. Uh, and it's kind of buried in, in everybody's testimony is the power of the draw of uh, broadband access and, and recruitment of you know, staff, caretakers, physicians. You know, if we want folks to come, and we know how urgent the need is uh, for care, uh, in our rural communities. Could you speak a bit about uh, what the impact would be to recruit uh, physicians and specialists uh, to the region um, with uh, broadband access? And also the cost piece. You, you, you mentioned the cost element that the hospital has to bear. Um, if you can get into more specifics about what that cost really feels like for you. Sure. So, sh so um, I can use my own, uh, my own self as an example. So when I moved to rural uh, Hoosick Falls, the first thing we asked our realtors, where is their internet access? Where can we get reliable um, service? Because as a radiologist, I know I'm going to need to look at images after hours. The farm we bought in 2003 happened to be the last house that had internet service. The only reason it had internet service was a previous owner was a soccer coach of a a team from Vermont, and the head of the cable company wanted his son on the soccer team. <laughs> so the deal was struck that his son would travel overseas if cable came to my house. My neighbors down the road, 16 years later, still don't have high-speed cable uh, broadband. So that's the draw. Whether you're a physician or a physician's assistant or a transcriptionist, um, our transcriptionists, we had to switch our providers. The transcriptionists that we had lived in an area where their internet wasn't um, uh, reliable enough to do the transcription work. We had to outsource it outside of Columbia County for a period of time until uh, the other system came back on. So that's really important. We asked about the cost, and cost in healthcare is always really sticky because it's 
whose cost is it? If we, Columbia Memorial Health, do telemonitoring, I know we can decrease the number of readmissions and the number of uh, health patients. That's the business we're in. That's what we want. Um, we can absorb that cost, but it would be nice if the reimbursement scheme, which we now have some codes where we can reimburse, but they should cover that cost for us. The people that, the, the entities that save dollars, real dollars, when you don't readmit a patient or you don't admit them at all, that's the insurance company or Medicare or Medicaid. Again, good to save money. I don't want to think, not much of think we don't want to save the money, but we're, we spend for the remote telemonitoring, monitoring, but someone else uh, financially gets the benefit. Thankfully, the patients get the benefit, and that's why we get into these projects to say, what can we do with the budget and the funding that we have? Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, Mr. Johnson, um, as the CEO of Electrical Cooperative, um, I, and as someone who has had to uh, figure out uh, how to disperse and implement the, the grant funding from the state, um, could you just speak a little bit to some of the limitations uh, that you've encountered um, when um, trying to ensure that you are best equipped um, to do the work uh, that you're asked to do uh, for your members and, and the community at large? Some of the limitations? Yes, in terms of uh, specifically, you know, if there are uh, communities that you're being asked to uh, implement broadband, how that choice is being made, and how are other actors in the space, other cable providers, for example, um, decisions being made that might affect where you're able to go um, and to what extent? Well, according to the terms of the New York Rural Broadband Grant, we agreed to provide service in specified census blocks. So we didn't have much choice uh, as, uh, during the past two years. Uh, after these two years, we'll have some opportunity, but the limitations are that, and the incentives are, to go toward density, the most dense areas, instead of to the most sparse areas, without public funding. Right. So that is the critical limitation. One of the other limitations, we know and can control the construction cost. Uh, we don't know, when we go into a particular project, what exactly the make ready costs are going to be to get on poles outside of Vought Siegel Electric's network. That is a unknown and a severe limitation without public funding to, to proceed down the road mm -hmm. uh, where you know that it can be tens of thousands of dollars to go the next mile for construction, uh, but the make ready could be, it could double that, right. uh, perhaps. And sometimes it doesn't, and you know, hallelujah moment, but when it does, you are uh, in a world of hurt if you're trying to make it happen. And could you speak a little bit to uh, the tax law issue that you flagged and how it has you know, negatively affected uh, OEC? Right, the tax law change happened after we made our bids, put our application <coughs> materials to together, did our feasibility studies, and we suddenly were confronted with the fact that we might have a 21% loss of our grants uh, federally and 9% state. So. Uh, obviously, it's on our scale project, with a $10 million project, it's a 30% adjustment in what we thought we were going to be able to do. We were bound contractually, uh, so we've gone out and borrowed the additional money, uh, and by December 15th, we'll be sending uh, an estimated tax deposit based on these public grants that we received in 2019, and in 2020, we'll receive more, probably, uh, this year we'll receive about four million, so we're confronted with about a million dollar loss. And then next year we're confronted with, on a six million dollar grant, perhaps another 1.8 million dollar loss. Mm -hmm. That goes directly to our bottom line. If we go directly to a borrower and uh, ask them for the ability to borrow. Uh, we believe we'll get it, but in the meantime, we are we would like to be able to go another mile, another two miles to the next people who are down the road, and we can't. Uh, for the short term, we have to pay that debt, and just the interest alone, you know, you can imagine a million dollars, about $50,000 a year, uh, maybe a little less at today's rates, 
uh, severely curtails our ability to reach out to those people who are relegated to satellite service. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Berman, I, I want you to speak. I know you've had uh, uh, been doing the work uh, to access and expand coverage uh, to the residents of Columbia County for some time, and I think you've alluded to some obstacles uh, that, that you've encountered. Um, specifically in the county. Could you speak a bit more about what those challenges are and, and why it's been such a challenge from your vantage point? Sure, it's a, it's a simple question that I think we all face here of density. Um, under uh, New York Public Service Commission rules for a television franchise, you must provide service to homes where the density is 35 homes per linear mile. Uh, most of the cable companies will give you something better. Uh, <clears throat> But when you look at the cost of modern fiber optic installation in a green field, meaning a virgin territory, we're talking about upwards of $40,000 a mile. So if there are seven or 10 homes, those homes are gonna have to be uh, contracted to you for the next, oh, I don't know, four or 5,000 years before you'll ever make money. Uh, <laughs> then you hit the issue of poll permits, which is one of the big nasty issues of, uh, you know, you just because you want to hang a wire on a pole, if you don't own the pole, you have to get a pole permit. And while the utilities are required to respond in a timely manner, the small ones do, the large ones couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. And so what we will find with a lot of the broadband program office money that has been granted, they are behind schedule because the large utilities do not give them access to the pole to hang the wire. And then you add in things like commercial secrecy of uh, nobody wants to tell you where they're going uh, in fear of others. And uh, one of the drawbacks of the state program is that they sign various non-disclosure agreements with Spectrum. Uh, and so the public has a hard time figuring out uh, where commercial service is available chairman of the county broadband committee, an elected official, uh, went from a two megabit DSL line for 50 bucks a month and happened to see a guy going down the street from one of the carriers and asked if service was available. And I said, oh yeah, we can bring fiber to your house tomorrow. And he went from two megabit DSL to a symmetrical gigabit at $71 a month um, and had no way of knowing that it was available. So there are you know, it's a problem of physically building it and then actually making the public aware that it might actually be available. Right, and, and on that first point uh, with regard to population uh, density, you know, it's interesting to me because it's so important to recognize that while uh, the market um, has uh, a, a rational way to operate and that way in which it operates is uh, you know, seeking out profit margins. Um, and so you don't have to make a normative judgment one way or the other whether or not uh, the market is acting in the way it ought to make money, right? So the question then becomes, what is the counterweight, right? What becomes the way to uh, uh, make sure that while that market operates the way that it does, it doesn't result in communities being left behind? And, and this goes back, uh, Mr. Miller, to your point about public-private partnerships and to the extent that those things can be uh, created via incentivization or subsidies or tax credits, whatever the case might be, I think we at the federal level must take a hard look at um, forming those kinds of partnerships and where they cannot be formed. Um, obviously, uh, taking this on in a more public works uh, standpoint by investing our, our revenue uh, more directly into these projects. I, I do want to just, uh, with our last question here, mapping came up quite a bit uh, over the course of the testimony, uh, the census block mapping clearly is flawed. Uh, again, to reiterate, this is a situation where you have one home uh, covered in one block and the whole block is deemed covered. And that makes a lot of sense when you have people living on top of each other in densely populated areas. Uh, but when they are not living on top of each other, you might want to consider a different way to track who has coverage and who does not. So. What might those other ways be? I mean, how important, for example, is to incorporate usage or subscription um, to access connectivity or household data? What are some of the ways we think that we can get to more nitty gritty data uh, to help us understand who in fact has coverage and who doesn't? Well, I think there's, 
you know, an important part of the self-reporting is, is important and the audits are important. Um, I, I think a lot of the small carriers would welcome auditing of the data to make sure that it's accurate. Um, but the subscription model is, is sometimes tough also because a customer can choose what speed they need for their particular house. So even if they take a 10 meg service now or a 25 meg service, that may not be a future-proof network. So part of the mapping really has to be what is the maximum speed allowed uh, your available on that technology. And I think part of the mapping solution should in include uh, future-proofing the network. You know, it, it's it's very frustrating to me. I'm. I'm a type of person that likes to build it once and build it right and, and have it there for 20 to 30 years. So by using fiber optic cable and dedicating a fiber to every single home, that house is future proof for the next 30 years. I can change out electronics on either side and go from 100 meg to 1 gig to 10 gig to 100 gig. The glass that's on the poles is there for the next 30 years. Um, sometimes we kind of limp along with um, improving the speeds of copper by shortening the distance, whether it's copper or coaxial, put in more cabinets, shorten the distance, I can take a 5 meg service to 10 meg, and then I meet the federal guidelines. So we're good for this round of funding, but in five years, we're going to have to do a whole new round of federal funding. And it becomes that kind of vicious cycle of continuously funding, upgrading the infrastructure. So I think part of the mapping process should be identifying where there is technology that's future-proof and really making sure that that is uh, how we're spending our money on infrastructure. So it sounds like what you're saying is an actual robust commitment to solving the problem and not just putting a Band-Aid over it bit by bit. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, well, I, I know we're running long on time. I want to just thank all the witnesses uh, for sharing their time with us and their testimony today. It's really been uh, a privilege. I just want to offer a closing statement um, before I gavel this out and then as noted you know, we'll stick around and do some questions with the commissioner. Um, connecting communities in rural upstate is of critical importance uh, to me and members of the small business committee for many years uh, but there have been too many Americans uh, who do not have access to the high-speed broadband connections they need and we've heard today what the implications are. Small electrical co-ops and other broadband service providers do not have the resources they need to build and sustain broadband networks where there are few subscribers and high construction costs. Uh, building out broadband infrastructure in rural America requires accurate maps and targeted federal funding, real, robust, targeted funding, so that billions of dollars of infrastructure incentives can reach the towns and communities that need them the most. Access to broadband can mean the difference between businesses opening and closing, students failing or passing and succeeding, uh, and lives being improved and saved. Uh, closing the digital divide should be a top priority for members of Congress. It certainly is one of mine, uh, representing all districts, uh, the FCC and the USDA. We must continue to push for policies until every community is served. I would ask uh, unanimous consent that members here uh, have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record without objection, so ordered. And if there is no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. I want to uh, uh, thank everybody again uh, for joining us. Uh, that concludes the formal uh, committee hearing. Uh, I'm going to now invite FCC Commissioner Starks to join our panelists for a few questions and then open today's hearing up for questions uh, from the audience. Yes. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, and this was a tremendous panel um, and uh, deeply valued what I heard today. Um, and thank you, of course, as well for the community. There, as you can tell, there are a lot of folks, uh, smart folks that are trying to think hard. Uh, I'm going to kind of throw out a universal question to the panel. I, we, um, because there was so much information covered, we did run a little bit long. Um, but I want to stick around for a few more minutes to hear from, from you all directly. Um, and, and the universal question is, it, it, that I really want to hear is this. A lot of you uh, participate in CAF 2. 
Um, I know uh, uh, Superintendent Dunn that um, the E-rate program is something that um, uh, I think we've 750 um, um, thousand dollars in support to E-rate in particular as well. Um, Dr. Belden, I don't know if your hospital participates in the rural health care fund that we have at the FCC. We should provide you with some information on that otherwise. Um, but for those of you that do participate in programs that we at the FCC fund, I would like to hear um, it, how your participation has gone, how it actually has, uh, uh, from a programmatic standpoint, your participation has gone, how you think we can do better. Um, and moving forward, what, what you would like to see. Uh, Ms. Hayes, uh, briefly, what I heard from you as well is um, with you working with your local provider, how you were able to actually work with them to produce a, a get a better service uh, to your farm and to your business. I would be interested to hear from you as well, although I know you don't participate in the FCC program, how your relationship on that local level has gone with your provider because as you can hear from today, it's important from the federal level that we get this right, from the state level that we get this right, from the local level that we get this right because each of you uh, has a touch that um, uh, needs to be serviced in a certain way. So maybe just start from you. Um, uh, Before they ask you to come, you gotta oh, sit yeah. right here for you, sir. <laughs> you sit right here. Who wants to jump in? Sure. Commissioner, great question. Uh, I did not know the answer, so my business manager uh, typed an answer for us. Um, uh, and I discovered, I of course worked with E-Rate and I was familiar with it, but the impact on our organization has been huge and beneficial since 1998. And thank you very much for providing that. Uh, in the last three years, we've been able to purchase and upgrade our switches, which have kept our connectivity where it needs to be, so all kids have access to broadband in all of our learning spaces in the school. So, thumbs up. As a telecommunications provider, we, we participate in a lot of programs. Yeah. So, um, the CAF2 funding, working with New York State, that was a huge win. That was, that was really well done. Um, it, it was a little slow getting through the process. We started our projects in January. Um, I think we were approved for CAF2 funding finally. Um, we received money in August, so there was a little bit of a lag. Um, the two other programs that I would talk about is uh, a lot of the loan programs provided, uh, administered by the RUS. Um, we, historically when we built out our copper network, we were a borrower from the RUS. Um, now we are no longer a borrower. Uh, we took our broadband programs, our $8 million that we had to contribute, and we wanted to go through the RUS. Um, it was like a, we submitted a thousand page application. Um, it would cost us between thirty and fifty thousand dollars to put that together with consultants because we don't have that kind of staff. And at that time, that application process was um, there wasn't enough detail on the assumptions, I guess. So they kicked the application back and said resubmit, and it'll take another <laughs> six months. Um, that has been improved, but I can't gamble another thirty to fifty thousand dollars to see that the process has improved that much. So. That's been, I mean, a thousand page application with all the spring documentation, it, it's too much. I mean, we have a relationship with our local bank and I'll pay the extra two percentage points because of the relationship. It'd be nice to have that kind of relationship with our US where they know our business, they get annual audited financials from us and they're ready to help um, when needed. Um, another <coughs> issue was, uh, you know, I, I do have concerns with I know uh, Congressman Delgado is very concerned with affordability of, of internet and under the New York State program, we have a, a ceiling of $60 for 25 meg for five years. Um, that's, a, that's a good start, but I think a, a concern I have is, is similar to expressed by Mr. Dunn, is when kids go home, there's a lot of programs out there to put tablets in their hands, but when they go home, they have to have internet at their house. And a lot of low income homes, renters, um, homeowners and renters, they don't live close enough where the kids can walk to the library or use the library, they're bus to school, and it's, it's a rural area. They're, it's very hard um, to get back to town. And if they don't have internet at their house, even sometimes $60, which when we pay pole attachments and make ready and construction, 
you know, sixty dollars that ceiling is is where we're at, and we offer it seventy five meg at that. But even sixty dollars can sometimes be <coughs> difficult. And under the Lifeline program now, it's nine dollars and twenty five cents um, to to poverty um, or low income assistance. It, it may be worth thinking about if there is some way to qualify homes for some kind of voucher for more um, towards internet service, you know, that, that assures that in low income homes, when students go home, they take their, you know, given tablet home with them, that they have connectivity there. And, and similar, I mean, uh, rural healthcare, a lot of the nursing homes are filled with rural people that um, don't have access to transportation or don't have access to um, specialists, and they end up in a nursing home because that's the only care they can get. With the telemedicine, if, again, if there's some kind of voucher program where the internet connectivity comes with the telemedicine program, then they have access to specialists, second opinions, everything right from the comfort of their home. As a company, we offer um, full medical care, but we also do a subscription to online medicine. And it's just so much better to be able to, when you have the flu, call from your house or FaceTime with a doctor, tell them what's going on, and then the prescription's waiting for you at your local pharmacy. Um, so, you know, I, I'm lucky to have internet con connectivity at my house, but those are kind of the concerns that I've seen with the program, um, and I'd be happy to talk about it further. Um, one last question, uh, because I do think, uh, yeah, I do think um, affordability is a critical piece of this, um, and where you're talking about um, folks both in urban areas as well as in rural areas, when you're talking about the charges that folks are talking about, um, um, whether it's worthwhile for folks to pay that additional monies per month, it can be difficult. Um, for folks to decide whether we know that it's $2,700 it costs the average American family, uh, and I don't know what it is in particular New York, for their cable bill, for their internet bill, and for their wireless their cell phone bills. Uh, and so for a lot of families, it can be um, a little bit of a bridge too far. Uh, but internet to the home is so critical because it's hard to create resumes, get job training, um, do homework on, on those types of phones. Um, the last question I would have uh, to you, Doctor, um, and you kind of touched, I think, maybe a little bit on this affordability where you were talking about how uh, it was hard to um, get the remote monitoring to go home based upon the cost that it would ultimately, I assume, probably have to be eaten by somebody else. Um, but tell me how you think um, um, uh, telemedicine in particular uh, can help with the opioid crisis. Uh, in getting some of the um, uh, mental health uh, and meeting people where they are from the mental health uh, aspect and the standpoint, uh, some of the pain management that also comes with that, uh, that's something that I've grown increasingly interested in um, and, and kind of the, um, um, also just the loneliness that I think uh, we also seem to see is wrapped up in that issue. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question because uh, as uh, we all we know too well in uh, healthcare, the opioid crisis, particularly in Columbia and Greene County, is a is a real problem. Okay. So telemedicine helps in a couple of ways. Um, it allows a person that has a need to access a provider, a mental health specialist, via their phone or um, tablet. Uh, or even text message, you don't need broadband for that, but the ability to reach out, the ability to be connected has been shown to be helpful for patients with all sorts of mental health conditions as well as substance abuse. We have used uh, telepsychiatry uh, with some of our patients where one of our offices that has a need uh, is hooked up to speak to our psychiatry providers, so that's an important piece. Increasingly, we're also seeing apps, apps on your phone that help individuals with substance abuse and addiction um, uh, in, in many different ways. Actually, just yesterday, our vice president for uh, our care centers, Dr. Ron Pope, had a conversation with one of these app developers uh, to 
look at how can we deploy something like this for our patients that either are addicted or or at risk. So, so really important. Excellent. That, I just want to piggyback off. That is a, a critically important uh, issue. Um, and I can tell you, I've uh, been to a lot of schools, um, high schools, middle schools, uh, and I hear an awful lot from our young people about uh, the mental health aspects uh, and the opioid uh, addiction piece here. Um, and I can't underscore enough uh, how important it is uh, to have this kind of service available uh, to young people. And you mentioned texting, but I think the, the ability to see and, and feel like you're actually having a conversation with somebody and that alone um, is of utmost uh, importance. Now I know, uh, Commissioner, that you are stretched for time, so um, we're going to say thank you for you to uh, to you for coming and uh, appreciate the time and the effort, and we'll certainly be continuing uh, the conversation. Appreciate it.